verse 11. Uh, he that hath ear, let him hear. With the Spirit saith unto the church eyes. Now you want to underline, with the Spirit. Now how is the tribulation saint supposed to hear? Well, just like the church age saint, with the Spirit. Uh, and he that hath an ear, let him hear. You've got to hear a certain way. Write that down. You've got to listen a certain way. How do you listen? It says, with the Spirit. With the Spirit. So you've got to yield to the Holy Spirit in you, and you've got to say, okay, Lord, help me hear this thing right. Help me take heed to it, and be listening with the Holy Spirit inside of you. It, it's a capital S. Uh, underline the word Spirit, capital S. So, you want to write down in your notes, the Holy Spirit is in the tribulation saint. The Holy Spirit is in the tribulation saint. Uh, that statement that's found uh, uh, in verse 10, I mean verse 11, He that hath the ear, let him hear with the Spirit, said unto the churches, plural, all seven churches. So that statement there is said, to all seven churches. Write it down. That's said to all seven churches. So if you look at the end of each one of the seven churches, you'll see that statement. Uh, it occurs in verse 17. He that hath the ear, let him hear with the Spirit, uh, saith unto the churches. Verse 17. Look at verse uh, 29. He that hath the ear, let him hear with the Spirit, saith unto the churches. Look at uh, verse 6, Revelation 3, 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit into the churches. Look at Revelation 3, 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit under the churches. And uh, 3, 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit said in the churches. Said in all seven churches. So in a tribulation, the Holy Spirit is thou. The Holy Spirit is, does a different work back in the church age. The Holy Spirit works different in the tribulation. And that's led folks to think that the Holy Spirit leaves in the tribulation, which he doesn't. He just does a different work. Now, uh, notice it says unto the churches, He that overcometh, the man overcomes in the tribulation, shall not be hurt, shall not be hurt of what? The second death. Now, let's turn to the cross-reference, Revelation chapter 20, and uh, pick up verse, uh, Revelation chapter uh, 20, verse, pick up verse 14. Revelation 20, 14. All right, Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. It says, And death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire. This is the... Second death. So second death is what? People going into hell. People going into hell. Look also at uh, 21, uh, Revelation 21, 8. 21, 8. But the fearful, those are the folks that go to hell. The unbelieving, they go to hell because they wouldn't believe. And the abominable, they go to hell because they're abominable. And murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers and idolaters, and all liars. Now we talk about that thing where the sin is connected with the person. You all remember that. Shall have their part, that's what they got coming to them, in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. That's hell. If it's a different place, you sure have a hard time uh, describing the difference between hell and the lake of fire. They're almost identical. You'd have a fit trying to figure out what the difference was between them. Which is the, what? Second death. So the second death is a man going to hell. Alright, now go back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And, uh, let's, uh, hmm. Well, I was trying to describe it more, but that's the best way to describe it, is the second death is uh, going to hell. So, watch up here. So here's the tribulation saint, in the tribulation, overcoming the mark of the beast. 
So why? So he won't be hurt of the second death over here when he's judged. So if he overcomes the mark of the beast here, he won't be hurt of the second death here. He won't go to hell. Y'all see it? See, that's not a church age saint back here overcoming anything. Tribulation saint overcoming the mark of the beast so he won't be hurt with the second death over here at the white throne, at the white throne judgment. He won't go to hell. All right. Uh, well, the, this judgment right here is for the uh, sheep and the goats. The sheep and the goats uh, are those that go through the tribulation who treat the Jew wrong. Those are the goats. They end up going to hell right there. They don't take the mark of the beast. They go through the tribulation and not taking the mark of the beast. They're goats, but they didn't treat the Jew right, so they go to hell. The sheep don't take the mark of the beast. They go through there, and they go to heaven because they treated the Jew right in the tribulation. That's the judgment of nations. And the brethren, the Jews, are not even judged there at the... Uh, judgment of nations. Those Jews are not judges of judgment of nations. They're just there saying, how did you treat the Jews? How did you treat them? Did you treat them right? Did you treat them good? How did you treat them? And they'll have millennial saints there. The millennium saints. See, the judgment seat of Christ takes place here. And the uh, great white throne judgment takes over there. The white throne judgment has the millennial saint and the tribulation saint in it. Yes, they're saved people. Look at Revelation chapter, look at Revelation chapter, let me get the verse 12, I believe it is. Uh, Revelation chapter 11. Look at Revelation chapter 11 and pick up verse 15. Revelation 11, 15. Her question is, her uh, statement was, they're saved people at the white throne judgment. Yes, but you've got to clarify that. Saved from not the church age, because they go to the judgment seat of Christ. So the, there's no saved from the church age. There's saved in the tribulation sense of the word, and saved in the millennial sense of the word, but not saved from the church age. Now, look at that uh, tribulation and millennial at the white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 11, pick up verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voice in heaven saying, now look at verse 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So what you just read right there is Armageddon, the seventh angel sounding, and it says the kingdom, Jesus Christ gets the kingdoms of this world, and he reigns for millennium, plus he reigns in eternity. So that's why it said forever and ever. Now, verse 16, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshipped God saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, and which are to come, because thou hast taken uh, of thee thy great power, and has done what? Has done what now, folks? Underline it and circle a word. Has done what? Reigned. R-E-I-G-N-E-D. Then the millennium is over when you hit that word in verse 17. The millennium is over. Now verse 18, and the nations were angry and the wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. That's Revelation chapter 20. That's after the millennium. And that thou shouldest give what? Rewards. That's a millennial saint and tribulation saint. Give rewards unto thy servants, the prophets. Tribulation. And to the saints and to them that fear thy name small and great, and should destroy them which destroyed the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was so on down through the passage. So verse uh, 17, reign, the millennial is over. 
verse 18, the great white throne judgment. And at the great white throne judgment, what do you find? You find the dead that are being judged and rewards are given to his servants. So when somebody tells you just the unsaved people are here, they're not correct. The millennial saint is there and the tribulation saint is there. There's the prophets in the tribulation. Prophets in the tribulation. There's no prophets in the millennium. The prophets come out of the tribulation and they're judged at the white throne judgment. They're judged on works. Faith and works. So when you get to Revelation chapter 20, notice what it says about them. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Pick up that uh, judgment. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 says, and I turn to the verse. Revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged up. Why is the book of life up there if they're all unsaved people? The book of life is there because some saved people are there. Because if their name's not in the book of life, they go to hell. Why is the book of life there to say he's saved, his name's in the book of life? All right. And the dead were judged every one of those things which are written in the book. Now I'm drawing it. According to their what? Works. Millennial saint, tribulation saint. Not the church age saint. If the church age saint, what is judged? His works are judged at the judgment seat of Christ. He's not judged. He's not judged. Over here, he's judged according to his works. And if he's got the works, the faith and the works, he's okay. And if he don't, he's not. Yes. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So when you read when you read uh, Revelation chapter, turn to Revelation chapter eleven, uh, Revelation chapter twelve, and uh, look what it says in Revelation chapter twelve, verse seventeen. And a dragon was wrath with the woman. Revelation twelve seventeen. And the dragon was wrath with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of seed. Now watch it. Which keep the commandments of God. That's works. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's faith. So it's faith and works. Look at Revelation chapter 14 verse 12. Revelation 14 12. Revelation chapter 14 verse 12. And it says... Here is the patience of the saints. Here are, the, here are they that keep the commandments of God and, and, and the face of Jesus. So at that particular time, it is faith and works. Look at Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. Revelation 22, 14. Here it is again. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that... What's the next word? Do. So it's faith and works. Do His commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life. That's tribulation and millennium. You don't have to change nothing. Notice I did not change one word. I didn't even explain the word. I just read the words. Did you notice that, folks? See, now, if you don't believe that, what a guy will do is he'll come along and try to explain it. I didn't explain it. I just read the verses to you. Now, if you don't believe the verses, you get in big trouble. That's why you've got to believe what the Bible says. As it says to who he's talking to. To who he is. Well, what that is. What deal is that? <laughs> All right, back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, and pick up verse uh, 12. And unto the angel of church of Pergamos. Alright, so he's writing to that angel. And that angel that uh, is over that church. 
Uh, these things saith he. So underline he. Who's the he? You can say it real loud. <laughs> Come on, folks. You all know who it is. Just say it real loud. Who is the he of verse 12? It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. Uh, to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now, if you spiritualize it, what would you make it if you spiritualize it? What's the sharp sword with two edges? Spiritualizing it. The Bible. What is it going to be if you don't spiritualize it? Last week. How many of you were here last week? All right. What? Nope. Well, sense, in a sense, but that's not making it clear. What cross reference should you have? The sharp sword with two edges. Okay, now let's look down in the context. Go down to take your pen and right after sharp sword with two edges, draw a line down to verse 16. Now maybe this will help you get the question. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against you against them with the sword of my mouth. The sword of my mouth is the sharp sword with two edges. Now what is the sword of his mouth or the sharp sword with two edges? Yes, but what cross reference do you want? You've got to write it down. Revelation chapter 19. We'll go across it again. Revelation chapter 19. Now, Revelation chapter 19, to get the context better, Revelation chapter 19 is this place right here. Look at the chart. Look at the chart. Revelation 19 is the second coming of Christ called Armageddon. Christ comes back on a white horse and destroys all the armies of the world at the battle of Armageddon. That's what Revelation 19 is. Let's pick up verse 3 now. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and him that sat upon it was clothed faithful and true, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. His eyes were the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knoweth but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, and the white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now watch verse 17. So Jesus Christ is doing what? He's riding back on a white horse. And the whole armies of heaven are following him. So get this picture in your mind. Here's Jesus Christ coming back from the third heaven. He's on a white stallion. And he's coming back to this earth to fight the battle of Armageddon. He destroys 200 million of the unsaved people of this world. He's on a white horse. And he's coming down. And he's going to destroy 200 million troops. 200 million. That's a slug of them, boy. Now, verse 19. And out of his mouth goeth a what? Come on, folks. A sharp sword. Now, what is that? I don't know what it is, but it destroys 200 million people. Just cuts them up and slices them up. Blood runs down through the valley of Megiddo four feet deep. So whatever that that comes out of the Lord's mouth, that he he slices everybody to pieces, two hundred million of them, and the and a river flows down through the valley of Megiddo that deep, four feet deep. Man, that's going to be quite a bloody mess, ain't it? It's just over. It's over. One guy's fighting the whole thing on a white horse. He's called the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And he's riding that horse, and he's the only one that fights it. And it just, that sword comes out of his mouth, and whatever that thing is that comes out of his mouth, it just slices everybody to pieces. But that's the Lord. He got that power. He's mad. He's ticked. He's fed up to here with the sin of this world. He's just sick of it. And he's been putting up with it for 2,000 years. He's been putting up with it. So when he comes back and destroys him, he said, I've had it. Okay, now watch verse 15. 
And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. That's the sword you're reading about. And with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a not rod of iron. It says when he smites the nations, he's called the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now look at this battle again that occurs and shows you how deep that blood flows down through the valley of Megiddo. Uh, uh, Revelation chapter uh, 14, which we're going back under those uh, another account of the tribulation. Get Revelation chapter 14 and look at verse 19. Revelation 14, 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was treading without the city and the blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridle. The horse's bridles. Well, now what's the horse's bridle, folks? You know what a horse's bridle is. The bridle's that thing that comes around here like this and comes up over. It's the bridle's right here on the horse. And a horse, that bridle's going to be about that deep. So the blood flows down through the valley of Megiddo and comes up to the horse's bridles. So the blood's about that deep. But he just gets through killing 200 million people. And horses. So it wipes the whole thing out. All right, back to Revelation chapter 2 now. Revelation chapter 2. So uh, let's skip down and look at verse 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. So when he says fight against thee, when he said fight against thee, he's coming back at the battle of Armageddon. He's going to fight against them with the sword of the mouth if they don't do what? Repent. You got it. So it's a warning for the tribulation saint to make sure he repents. Or he's going to end up going to the battle of Armageddon and get cut up with the rest of them. See, it's a warning for the tribulation saying, Say, be on your toes, bud. Don't you take the mark. Don't you take the mark. Because you're liable to lose it. All see that? All right. Revelation chapter 2 now. Revelation chapter 2. And pick up verse 13. I know thy works. Again, that said to all seven churches. I know thy works. Now let's spiritualize it. The Lord knows what you, he knows what you're doing for him. Amen? And he knows what you're not doing. The Lord, uh, I know thy works. God is talking. Jesus Christ is talking. I know thy works. And, but watch this, where thou dwellest. Now where do they dwell? They dwell where? Even where Satan's seed is. So are they dwelling in a great wonderful place? Or are they dwelling right next to the devil's seat. Where Satan's seat is. They're dwelling right where Satan's seat is. And you ever hear somebody say, well, I'm in a real bad place, so I, I, don't, uh, I can't do right because I'm in a real bad place? No, that's no excuse for doing, doing wrong. Being in a real bad place, these folks did right. He says, hold us fast my name, even though you're right next to where the devil's sitting. The devil's on a seat. Look at the last... Uh, words in the verse. Satan dwelleth. Draw a line back up to Satan seat is. So the devil has become incarnate in a man. And he's become a man and coming and he sits on a seat on his earth. He's the Antichrist. So the devil's come down. That's why it's called Satan seat. It's a chair. Sitting in a seat. Sitting in a chair. Alright. Now let's get a few cross references for this. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 13. Satan's seat. Satan dwelleth. He dwells there and sits there. It's his. His chair. Now turn to Revelation. And it's in the tribulation now. Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. It's on this earth. Revelation 13, 2. Revelation chapter 13 verse 2 says, And the beast which I saw us was like a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. The dragon. There's that satanic trinity we talked about before. So you got the beast and the dragon and the false prophet. Alright. The dragon gave him his power. 
and his, what's that word right there? S-E-A-T. So who gave the beast his seat? Who? The devil. But in the verse it says the dragon. The dragon. The dragon is the devil. So the dragon gave the Antichrist his seat. All right, now take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 16. He has a seat. He has a chair. So that's absolutely, you want to know something about it now. Revelation chapter 16, pick up verse 10. Revelation 16, 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the, now take your pen and underline it, S-E-A-T, it's a chair, the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness. All right. Underline seat of the beast. The beast is the Antichrist. So the Antichrist has a chair. He has a seat that he sets in. Okay. Now let's get some more on it. Take your Bible and turn to Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. The book of Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. Now watch for a man who sits in a seat. He's going to sit in a seat. But he's not really a man. He's a beast. A revelation chapter, uh, uh, no, Ezekiel chapter 28. Let's pick up verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because... Now underline this. Because thy heart is lifted up. Number one, he was proud. His heart was lifted up. And thou hast said, he said something. What did he say? Pay attention to what you say. Pay great attention to what you say. Because thou hast said, now watch it, I am a what? Is that with a small g or with a capital G? So he's saying what? He's saying, I am Jesus Christ. I am God. He didn't say God. I am a God. Oh, yeah. He says a, there's a in front of G with a capital G. A God. I am a God. See, a man is saying it. Let's read a little bit further. A man is saying it. I am a God. But when he put a capital G on it, he's saying, I am, I am Jesus Christ. No, no, no. No, let's read a little bit further and I'll show you, show you what I'm trying to say. I am a God and sit in the seat of God. Okay, the seat of God can be two places on this earth. Where are the two places it might be? Number one, it could be the Pope's chair where he speaks ex cathedra. Or it can be in that temple that's going to be rebuilt on the mercy seat that has a seat in it that God set in through the whole t Old Testament, which is the mercy seat. And God set on the mercy seat in the Old Testament all through uh, from Exodus on until the temple was destroyed and, and went back into it. Uh, and I don't know that he sat there after it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, but he said he was there till at least then. All right, said in the seat of God, in the midst of the sea, thou art, underline the next two words, thou art what? A man and not God. Thou hast set thy heart as the heart of God. So this is a man saying he's God. That's the Antichrist. That's the Antichrist. He's saying he's God. Who on this earth says they're God right now? The Pope says he's Jesus Christ. He thinks he's Jesus Christ. 
And when, when, he sets, when he speaks out of the chair, ex cathedra, what he says is, is perfect. Right? When he speaks ex cathedra out of the chair, whatever he says, it's like God saying it. Spoken of as ex cathedra. Spoken of out of the chair. Oh, he says it down, he said it many times down through history. The Pope does. He said it many times. He is set in the chair, has it. And the, and the Pope before him, I have too. Okay, now another verse. Take your Bible and turn to First Thessalonians. I mean, Second Thessalonians. So I'm not saying the the Pope is an anic is the Antichrist. I'm not saying that uh, he may die. So that proves he wasn't, unless he comes back alive. And uh, then it will then look out, boy. If he dies and comes back alive, look out. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians chapter two. And watch it, watch it again. So the devil, as he is a beast, has a seat, and he has a chair, and he speaks out of it, ex cathedra. It's either in the Vatican or it's here. Second Thessalonians two. Look at verse, let's pick up verse three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, that he as God, what's that next word right after God? Sit us. So circle the word. Circle the word. Sit us. Sit us. So the devil has a chair. He's sitting in a chair. And it's on this earth. It's not right now. Unless we're in the tribulation. <laughs> but I don't think we are. So it's going to happen in the tribulation. Now watch it. Watch where he's sitting. In the what? The temple of God. So we look at Revelation chapter 11. So the temple's rebuilt. So the Antichrist goes to the temple and sits down in the temple and says, I'm God, worship me. And when that thing takes place, the Jews head for the country. They say, this man's not God, he's, a, he's the devil. He ain't Jesus Christ, he's the devil. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. And notice that the temple is rebuilt. Sometime in the tribulation, the temple's going to be rebuilt. So the Antichrist will go and sit down in the temple and say, I am God, worship me. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, pick up verse 1, And there was given me a rod like unto a reed, Revelation 11, 1, And the angel saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, there it is, underline it, temple of God, and the altar, it's going to be there, and them that worship therein, going to have some folks worshiping, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under feet forty and two months. Forty and two months, second half of the tribulation. So the temple's going to be there. So the Antichrist goes to the temple in Jerusalem and sits down in the temple on the mercy seat and says, I'm God, worship me. Why, over in the Old Testament, the mercy seat was there, in the, in the tent is it traveled in the wilderness, and it was in uh, Solomon's, and in between the cherubim on this side and the cherubim on this side, there was a mercy seat right on top of the ark, and that's where God was. No, no probably a temple of some kind. Maybe a tent. Might be a tent. Might be a tent. It, it, it might be. Because cause when you get over here, when you get over here, Jesus Christ builds a temple there in the millennium, and that temple's given in uh, given in chapter uh, Ezekiel, chapter uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 40, the millennial temple is given from chapter 40 1, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, and 47, and 48 is the millennial temple built by Jesus Christ. 
So in Ezekiel chapter 40 through chapter 48 is the millennial temple built by Jesus Christ. So the tribulation temple built by whoever doesn't make much difference because the Lord's not going to use it anyway. Only the devil's going to use it. And the Lord's not going to honor it because the Jews are not right with him during that period of time. So it don't make any difference where they build a temple. They build it on the Dome of the Rock. Okay, if they don't build it on the Dome of the Rock, it don't matter because the Lord's not interested in it. The devil's going to sit on it. Yeah, who would want to sit on that throne after the devil incarnate sat on it? Jesus Christ's not going to sit on it. He's going to build his own temple over here. All of the God gather a different one. Yes, you hear about it, and they may, they, they're saying, we've got to build it on the Dome of the Rock. No, they don't. They don't have to build it on the Dome of the Rock. That temple don't make any difference where they build it. Sure. But how are they going to build it on the Dome of the Rock where it was built over in the Old Testament, the Mosque of Omar sitting on the, on the Dome of the Rock, and you would have to defy all, every nation that surrounds Israel to build that temple there. Because they're all mo uh, Muslims. And that's what the big fight is about. The big fight is, it's a religious fight. <laughs> it's a fight about the Muslims and Jesus Christ and, the old, and God of the Old Testament. It's a, that's what the fight is. And they ain't going to solve it until Jesus Christ comes back. But they're going to build the temple. They're going to build it there. Some are going to build it. The Antichrist is going to come in and sit down in the temple and say, I'm God, worship me. And the whole world is going to worship him. And you'll get your head cut off if you don't. And you can't buy or sell if you don't. You can't buy milk. You can't buy potatoes. And you can't buy bread if you don't worship the Antichrist in tribulation. There are some people that grit their teeth and say, we don't care, we can make it without. And there are some, there are quite a few. There's a lot of folks in this world that are independent and are not set up in... There won't be very many Americans. <laughs> Let me tell you, not many Americans will get it. There, there'll be a few. I believe there'll be a few Americans. They grit their teeth. No, they're going to get raided real quick. <laughs> they're going to get raided real quick. They'll be the first ones to go. Because everybody knows they got it. They know they have it. and They've known it for years. And they'll say... Let's head for Salt Lake City. When it doesn't rain for two years, brother, it don't rain for two years, they'll take Salt Lake City and burn it to the ground looking for food. If you want something to eat, you'll kill, you'll kill just as fast as you can breathe. People will kill, any, kill you. Just, they won't even think about killing you to get your food. When you get to starving to death, boy, you'll do a lot, a lot of things to stay alive, to eat. Yeah, they won't go that far. <laughs> They'll go to a lot of big cities. But let's get back to it. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And uh, thank God you're not going there. Revelation chapter 2. And verse 14 now. So you should have those cross references. 1 Thessalonians 2 4. Revelation 13 2. Revelation 16 10. And Ezekiel 28, 2, connected with the devil's seat and his chair. It's either in the Vatican or it's in that temple. I think, now I'm not absolutely sure, but I think he's going to put the three, first three and a half years in the Vatican and the second three and a half years on the mercy seat in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm guessing on that one though. Uh, verse 14, And I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Okay, now you get into three things here on the doctrine of Balaam. Three of them. You got to get the cross references. Before we leave the verse, let's get the doctrine of Balaam. What is it? It follows what he just said. Who taught. So underline the word taught. Doctrine is taught. So Balaam taught. Balak. Balaam taught Balak. So Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. 
to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. That's his doctrine. That's, ba that's uh, Balaam's doctrine. Now, to get an exact thing on his doctrine, before we go to the other two verses, turn to number 31, verse 15. Write that in the margin of your Bible. Numbers chapter 31. You remember the story of Balaam. He's the one that had that uh, donkey that talked back to him. <laughs> Boy, and that was uh, an experience of a lifetime. <laughs> uh, going down through there, riding that donkey, and that dog, he turns around and starts talking to him. Boy, I mean, what a rebuke. Numbers chapter 31, verse 15. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Now, they are supposed to kill them. Now verse 16. Behold, this caused... I'm in, I am in Numbers chapter 31, verse 16. I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. You need to get there to it. You need to turn to the verse. Numbers chapter 31, verse 16. Numbers 31, 16. All right, if you're there, say amen. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? That's a question. Behold, thus caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Pura. There was a plague among the congregation of Israel. Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known man by laying with them. You say, why is that? Because they had a sex problem. So the Lord says, kill them all. And some folks say, you have a sex problem? Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. The Lord said, kill them. Now, uh, now what you want to get is right there, in verse 16, through the counsel of Balaam. Now this is the doctrine of Balaam. So Balaam tells him to do something. Uh, and uh, look at Numbers. Take your Bible and turn to Numbers. And turn back to Numbers chapter 25. And pick up this doctrine of Balaam. So Balaam wanted to curse the children of Israel. You all with me now? And God wouldn't let him. So he still wanted that buck that uh, Balak was paying him. So secretly he went to Balak and said, I'll tell you how to get this thing done. You, I can't curse those, all those hundreds of thousands of people out there. There are two million of them. He says, I can't curse them because God won't let me. But I'll tell you how to mess them up. Just take all your women over here and get them to go over there and get them young men and marry those young boys and then all your girls will marry their young boys and you know what will happen? Next thing you know, all them young boys will be in following the gods of these young girls and you know what our gods are like and you know what their God will do to them? He'll wipe them out because they've left their God. That's, what, that's the doctrine of Balaam. Do you know what the doctrine of Balaam is? is to get folks to intermarry to get them in their religion. So they say it comes, comes like this. Well, uh, you can't get married unless your children, the children belong to this church. Come on, now, some of you folks know what I just said. Some of you don't. You say, what is that? Well, wait a minute. When a fellow gets married, he can marry anybody he wants to marry. And what, what, what kind of doctrine would I be saying? Now, you've got to marry married in this church and the children got to sign in an agreement that they will never be anything but a Baptist. Garbage. That's the doctrine of Balaam. Okay, now, uh, take your Bible and turn to the book of Jude. Jude verse 11, right in front of the book of Revelation. Jude verse 11. Now, you have the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, Numbers 25, I left that. Numbers chapter 25, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Numbers chapter 25. Numbers 25 is the thing taking place. Look at verse 1. Numbers 25, 1. That's the thing taking place. Uh, Numbers 25, 1, verse 1 says, And Israel abided Shittim, and the people, now watch it, here it is, began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. 
There it is. That's what Balaam taught him. He said, you go over there, just get your daughter to go over there and marry all those Israelite young men. And, there, and pretty soon that young daughter will say, I want you to go to church with my church. Come on, I want you to go to my church. And that's the way a woman is. Come on, folks, don't you know how a woman is? I want you to go to my church. And uh, so the, he said, well, I don't, I don't like down there. I hate that. And pretty soon she bugs him to death. Well, come on, you don't love me. Come on, and back and forth. They have a big old fight about it. And pretty soon he goes to her church. It's in Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. It was the doctrine of Balaam. And they call the people unto the sacrifice of what? Verse 2. Underline it. The sacrifice of what? Their gods. Balaam knew how to mess up the children of Israel, and that was his doctrine. And that's what he counseled Balak to do. God wouldn't let him. Balaam. He had the thing right on the money. But, and then the Lord got mad at him. <laughs> and they had to get right and repent and all that. All right, Revelation, uh, the book of Jude. Jude verse 1, verse 11. Jude verse, uh, there's only one verse, verse, uh, ele verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. That's uh, back Cain and Abel, back there in Genesis. Gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after, now here is not the doctrine of Balaam, but what? The heir of Balaam. Now, Balaam erred. And the heir of Balaam is a uh, service without love. Uh, Balaam served God, but he didn't love, he loved money. He loved money. Balaam loved money. That was his whole problem. He wanted to buck those fires for trying to give him. But it wasn't, it wasn't for his heart motive wasn't right. All right. The way of Balaam. For what? Underline the next two words. For what? Reward. So it's a love of money. Love of money. All right. Now, look at Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15. And uh, here's the way of Balaam. You have the doctrine of Balaam, the heir of Balaam. And in Second Peter 2, 15, you have the way of Balaam. Second Peter 2, 15. Second uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Peter 2.15 Which have forsaken the right way and gone astray and following, now here it is, it's not the error and it's not the doctrine which you just read in Revelation and Jude. Here it is what? The way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now way, in order to get it, you have to look at John chapter 14 verse 6. John 14, 6, and this will give you the word way. John 14, 6. Now I'll just read the word and you tell me what the way would, would show you about the way of Balaam. John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What's the way there? And he's the way to what? To heaven. So the way is what? The way is how you get into heaven. Jesus Christ is the way to heaven. Amen? So the way is going to be justification by works. Balaam taught justification by pure works. Where in the Old Testament it would be faith and works. In the Old Testament it's faith and works, not just works. Balaam teaches it by works. <laughs> All right. Now, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 14, the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to commit things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication at the doctrine of Balaam. So hast thou also then to hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Nicolaitans, there's that word again. Nicol, meaning to conquer and to rule over. Nicol. Laetin comes from laity. Laity. So what is it? It's to teach that some folks are laity and some folks are the clergy. So they separate the difference between the clergy and the laity. A lot of folks do it. 
Some Baptists do it, brother. Some Baptists do it. I know some Baptist preachers, they think they're just, I mean, they're just almost like the Pope, boy. They run their church like a, almost like the Pope runs the Catholic Church. And they're Baptists. Boy, they rule, they run it with a rod and iron, boy. You know something? I can preach a lot of things from the pulpit. But when it gets out of the pulpit, I don't say too much to you, do I? Once in a while, I'll say something. But I sure let you slide a lot out of the pulpit. I know some preachers that just really nail you, lock, stock, and barrel, tell you who you can marry, who you can't marry, where you can spend your money, where you can't spend your money, who you can date, who you can't date. Well, I've met some preachers who tell you everything you do. <laughs> How to walk in the whole world, boy. Oh, it works. Well, I'll tell you. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Uh, Nicolaitans, which things I hate. There's really no difference between you and me. Now, I have an office to fulfill, and that office is, is as a pastor, and that's the job that God's given me. But you know something? I'm a sinner the same as you are, and I have the same temptations and the same problems and the same heartaches as you do. Come on, folks. Verse 16, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against the, uh, them with the sword of my mouth. We went across that. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit said unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the, what? Hidden manna. Now we're not going to have time to get into the hidden manna, so we're going to have to stop. But what I want you to do, not study on the hidden part of the manna yet, Go home and study just the manna. Just study the manna over there in the Old Testament and just find out everything you can on the manna. We'll get the hidden part of it later. Now how many of you do it say amen? Okay, go home and study just the manna. The manna should be easy to find over in the Old Testament. So get that part down good. So when I'm going across this, you'll say, Oh, I know what the manna is. Oh, I know what the manna is. Okay? But we'll go about the hidden part of it later because you can't possibly get it in the length of time. So let's quit and have a prayer request. Can't possibly get it now, folks. <laughs>